Hi, this is your coach, JDP, and you are excellent. You are excellent is all about demystifying coaching and mentoring uh, for underestimated people from under-resourced zip codes so that they can find entry, acceptance, belonging, success, growth, and permanence in the career they're choosing and in their lives. Today, I'm so thrilled to have Ruben Singh. Ruben Singh is the founder and CEO of One Tenth Consulting, which is a Salesforce consulting practice that works exclusively with nonprofits for their strategy, implementation, and managed services. And we're going to get into all that. Uh, but more importantly, Ruben is a certified DEI practitioner, and he serves on the board of N10, and we'll get into that as well, uh, which is a nonprofit that supports uh, missions and movements through skillful and equitable use of technology. So Ruben ha is also, this guy is amazing. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. I'm just so thrilled. Ruben, welcome to You Are Excellent. Oh, thank you so much, uh, JDP. Glad to be here. You know, Ruben, you and I have had the opportunity to get to know each other over the years. At a former company, we worked together on a couple of projects. But for my viewers who don't know you, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. No, thank you. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I, I guess a little bit about myself. Uh, I uh, you know, gr grew up uh, you know, on the East Coast of the U.S. Uh, uh, from an immigrant family. And, um, you know, I, uh, in, in being part of an immigrant family, you know, we, we, we had some very specific goals. Hey, you know, you need to get out there, get your education, start working as quickly as possible. And I, I went through that path and um, had the opportunity to um, you know, get my, my degree in information systems and, and took the first jobs I could find. Um, but to be honest with you, uh, JDP, after a few years into my career, I I kind of fizzled out and realized, you know what, I wasn't really mm -hmm. into technology so much. And uh, I uh, I was living in Chicago at the time, and I found myself uh, volunteering and just getting involved in a lot of um, charitable projects, uh, advocacy initiatives, and um, and realized, well, you know, that that was actually my calling. Um, and I I considered making some uh, career changes to social work or or things that were more aligned with with you know my values. Um, but thankfully, I, I sort of stumbled upon some opportunities that that mixed my love for um, uh, for mission based work uh, and and still keeping a lot of my technology roots, um, and that's kind of where I found myself in in, in the career that I'm in and, and had the the privilege to to start uh, uh, my own practice about eight years ago with One Tenth, um, wow. which has led us to kind of do things in a in a in a little bit of an unconventional way in the way we consult with nonprofits. So yeah, it's yeah. a little bit of my story. Yeah, well. He's, I, I know a little bit more than that, but, um, but, but awesome. And so from the immigrant experience, right, yeah. because I've had a number of different people on and one person in particular talked about his immigrant experience coming from Guyana. Can you mm -hmm. tell us about your immigrant experience? And, and um, I have a follow up question after that. Sure, sure. Uh, you know, my my parents came from Punjab in the late seventies, uh, and so I was born and brought up here. Um, but I would say, like, uh, you know, it it is a different experience. And I think growing up as a as a Sikh um, with my you know, trying to keep my my Sikh faith traditions, um, that sort of brought its own you know, great experiences, but also some challenges too. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so I think that shaped a lot of my youth and 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 really trying to live that American experience. But at the same time, realizing that people do not look at me as an American, I mean, I'm navigating yeah. those waters. I think that was a lot of, um, you know, the, some of the challenges that I had growing up. Um, yeah. 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 You talked about, you know, your American experience, but in the American, well, in general consciousness, um, American doesn't look like you and me. Can you talk to me a little bit about uh, the challenges you faced as a Sikh uh, mm. in American culture? Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks for that. That's a, it's, I appreciate the question. I mean, um, you know, I, I would say I, I grew up with a pretty normal childhood in, in the sense that, um, but, you know, there were always, there were always things, you know, things that, that I, I, at the time, I just thought were weird that happened to me, you know, um, even, even like, you know, as a teenager trying to get a job, um, you know, at the mall or something, I, I would have a phone conversation, you know, my name is Ruben and I'm having this conversation on They're like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, come, come in, you know, we, we have this sales position. How soon can you start? And, 
And then you show up an hour later and they say, oh, you know, actually the job is, is filled. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in, in moments like that, I used to kind of write it off as a kid, like, oh, that was, that's odd. You know, they, they told me they were ready to hire me. They told me to bring all my paperwork. Uh, but when I got there, it's, you know, maybe, maybe I misheard, maybe I misunderstood. And uh, thankfully I, I didn't dwell on those things. I just kind of like, you know, took them as, as, you know, that's bizarre. Um, but now, you know, in my, in my career, you know, learning more, knowing more, I realized, oh, th those weren't just sort of, you know, anomalies or those weren't, uh, you know, just mistakes, you know, that, that was part of my experience of, mm -hmm. you, know, if you want to call it, you know, racism or discrimination bias, you know, um, there's all kinds of names for it now that we didn't have back then. Um, but, but I, I say that, that kind of shaped a lot of the experience, you know, and, and of course, uh, you know, there was some element of bullying, being in school, just looking different. I mean, um, and so there was there was definitely those moments that kind of shaped my experience um, as a kid. I'd say um, even in through my professional career, uh, I would say that some of those anomalies or weird moments still happen. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, where, right. so. where somebody will say something or, you know, there'll be an off color comment or uh, where, you know, I say, hey, that's that's weird. You know, that, that didn't feel right. Um, uh, but now I feel, you know, I have that, you know, agency to, to speak up or to say something when those moments occur. Yeah. And, and, and all for transparency, yeah. you know, I, as I mentioned to you before we started taping, I did some research out of respect mm. to understand a little bit more about the Sikh religion and everything else. So, uh, definitely, uh, yours is a voice that's important that, uh, beyond the context of mentoring and coaching that I feel needs to be out there. So again, thanks for being here with us today and sharing your experience. Oh, thanks, J.D. B. And I appreciate you doing that research as well. Oh, you got it, man. So let's get to the crux of it. So, you know, you're yeah. excellent. is all about bringing under uh, coaching and mentoring to underestimated people from under-resourced zip codes so they can better understand, you know, what this is all about and whether it's right for them. And if so, how to leverage that to, uh, become successful in their careers. Yeah. Um, you know, we have talked, you and I, about a number of different things, and we've had an opportunity to be at conferences, et cetera, and, and really s sit down one-on-one -on -one and talk. But the question that I always have for my guests is, what brought you to mentoring or coaching? What is it that, that drove you to want to give back? Yeah. Yeah, you know, um, uh, I, I feel like I've I've come across mentoring and coaching at different facet, facets of my life, different aspects of my life. Um, you know, mentioning growing up as a sick and having a different experience, I was also very lucky to have um, uh, experiences going to uh, like summer camps and and getting involved in retreats where other sicks from around the country would gather every summer. And you know, we'd it'd be a little bit of a theological discussion, but also you know, just having fun and leadership and activism, and 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 we would really focus on all those things and. And those uh, those were very meaningful experiences for me um, uh, because you know for one week out of the year I just felt like you know everybody else I saw everybody who looked around me who had similar experiences than I did so I really cherished those camp you know experiences uh, from there I, I got I loved it so much I I became you know I, I became a counselor then I became an educator and then I started organizing the camps um, and, and even even to this day I I I, I do um, I still teach at, at the camps and educate where now my children go to the camps. Right. Um, over the summer retreats, all sorts of uh, activities. And I, th I think that's where a lot of my coaching and mentorship has come into play. So, you know, I, I have the opportunity to work with a lot of young folks where, you know, they want to ask me about, you know, uh, where they need guidance on career, they need guidance on um, uh, education, you know, their path for college and all that. But but it's it's through a slightly different lens. It's like not just, you know, career and college guidance, but, you know, through the lens of the sick experience, like, hey, you know, you're Ruben, you've, you've navigated these waters before, you know, what, what is a, what is a way that I can, a path that I can go yet still retain a lot of my faith tradition or be able to keep my values or mm -hmm. um, so on and so forth. So it's, it's, it's that sort of framing of uh, a mentorship that, that I think uh, really kind of got me into interested in the idea of mentoring and coaching um, uh, is in that environment and helping young sick youth who, um, um, you know, now that I, you know, I'm first generation American um, and now, you know, younger folks are coming in who are also first generation, but, you know, thankfully I have 30, 40 years of experience uh, that I can speak to. So, so that's where a lot of my um, uh, foundation of, of, of mentoring and coaching has come to play. You know, it can be a really lonely place being first and only for, first, right? And so there's two different distinctions. I want to distinguish first and then only. 
Yeah, yeah. Only in a in in a setting, only in a school, only in did you have any person outside of your family unit that you consider a mentor or coach that kind of helped you through that? Or did you have to kind of figure it out on your own? Yeah, that's a great question. I can't think of any like one person in, in uh, who really served as a, a mentor, you know, like you said, outside of my family. Um, but I would say there was a lot of moments. <laughs> there mm-hmm. was a lot of moments where, you know, I, I observed something or I, uh, you know, I, I just was able to you know, listen or to learn or just, you know, through observation or just being around other people who I admired or being around other people who, you know, had it a little bit more figured out than I did. Um, and and um, I, I learned a lot from those moments of being very uh, observant. <laughs> um, and and you know adapted a lot of that life that that model and way of doing things and way of approaching things um, um, myself, um, and and I'd say that's kind of how I modeled a lot of those behaviors without actually having like a true mentor or coach at the time. So um, you were your mentor, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, and I was very grateful to have been in uh, places and environments where I got to observe some pretty cool things. Mm. Uh, so, so yeah, I was my own mentor, but um, definitely um, have you know, was in the right place at the right time to be able to get, get those moments that, that really meant a lot. This is really interesting because as you spoke about, you know, challenges that you faced as a young person growing up in America and the school system and everything else, right? And the playground or what have you academically. Then you had your college experience and then you went into the corporate world and you said, hey, so there was some acceptance and belonging issues there. Could you talk to me a little bit about that, that early experience? Yeah. You know, uh, as as a consultant in my earlier years, um, you know, there there were a lot of those, you know, odd odd situations or odd behaviors or things that were said. Um, and I just kind of wrote everything off as, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm junior in this role or, you know, here, look at the people around me. These are experts. These are people who are, you know, well-respected. They're thought leaders. They're, they're the, 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 the experts in this space, the one that everybody looks up to. So they must be right. Um, and, and I'm the one who has to learn how, how to do things. Um, and, you know, some, some like examples of that might, could, could be, um, you know, uh, uh, it could be as simple as uh, you know we're implementing some technology and we use practices that might be outdated, um, you know things like uh, uh, personas that are very stereotype based and they can you know introduce a lot of um, bias and discrimination just from the discussion itself. I always thought it was weird, you know, when a group of white men in a room are saying, "Here, like this is what this single black woman uh, why she goes to our not why she gets services from our nonprofits and you know like, I, I was very uncomfortable with these conversations where everybody around me seem to be okay with it, um, okay. you know, or, uh, you know, making a lot of assumptions about a demographic that might be uh, interested in the services that this nonprofit's offering. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the type of language that's used uh, made me very uncomfortable too. Um, or algorithms, even from a technology perspective, that were actually um, perpetuating a lot of uh, 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 bias-based results um, in, in the data that we were pulling. So all of these things were kind of happening around me. And, um, and, and, you know, I kept quiet because I thought, you know, this is this is just the way the, the professionals do it. Um, but it wasn't until um, actually, you know, getting into some activities with N10 uh, where they are very mindful about having these kinds of conversations. And I participated in some racial affinity spaces and we all started talking. We were in a room full of technologists of color. And I started realizing, oh, I'm not the only one who thought this stuff was weird. <laughs> you know, all of us have have had things or all of us have been in situations where, you know, we didn't get that promotion where the person behind us did or, you know, we didn't get that salary raise or, you know, that we you know, they promoted us. You know, they're willing to give us the, the salary raise, but not the actual title change, because, oh, if you're in you know, the title change and that means you're you're part of the executive team. Uh, you know, all these, the, the moving glass ceilings, um, all these things that I thought were just oddities that happened to me. Um, as I started talking to more technologists of color, I started realizing we're, we're all experiencing these things. Um, and, and I think, you know, that made me feel very empowered. And it, it's what made me uh, want to start my own practice um, and, and to say, well, you know, I don't need to really try to find a seat at this table. I'll just create my own table nice. and, um, uh, and, and uh, try to bring folks along with me. So, Ruben, <laughs> here's the thing. You're in the room. 
you're the only in the room. Yeah. Trust me. <laughs> you're the only in the room. You have been invited into the room. Mm -hmm. You've earned your place to be there. Then the little voices in our head start talking. And that is typically to just generically categorize it as imposter syndrome. How did you navigate those voices in your head when you're in that space? Yeah. Or did you? Were you? I, I'm just fascinated here with this yeah, question. Yeah. No, it's, it's a very important question, important topic. And so absolutely, I, I definitely have faced that imposter syndrome in, in all aspects of my work. I, I still experience it to a large extent. Um, and I sometimes feel like, well, I need to over prepare or I need to over, I need to prove, uh, you know, that, that I'm an expert in this space, even though I have 25 years of experience in this, I, I felt like I, I still need to always prove more than the person next to me just to prove that I need to be at that table. So there's always that thought in the, in the back of my mind. Um, uh, and, you know, sometimes I would, I remember earlier in my career, I, I would, as a, as a, um, as a leader, as a manager, I would bring some of my junior consultants or junior staff with me um, to shadow. And then the client who might be meeting us for the first time uh, would address all the interns, like they, they, mm -hmm. and you know, not realizing that that I'm actually the one who called the meeting. <laughs> so, so like you know, oftentimes I'm just in spaces where they assume, oh no, you you, you can't, you know, you might you might be a developer, you fit my archetype or my stereotype as as a programmer or something, but I, I can't imagine you as a as a leader or as a manager. So all those things kind of stick with me, and I think help it, it fuels my uh, imposter syndrome. Um, but I, I will say at this age, I'm, I'm kind of, um, I'm pivoting a little bit more and I'm, I'm understanding it. And, you know, a lot of my students actually ask me about imposter syndrome and, you know, how I've tried to navigate it. And I think that, I think like the best advice, uh, you know, that I've given myself and that I give others when it comes to imposter syndrome is, um, start having more conversations with people. Um, start talking to people, um, you know, to other leaders, to other people in, pa in positions of power or in places that you want to be. And uh, the more you talk to them, you're going to learn a lot of stuff. <laughs> and, and you're going to learn that, you know what, you know, th these people are no smarter than me. They're no more intelligent than me. They they have no more experience than I do. They, uh, you know, th th that I've, I very much, you know, belong in these same seats. So, um, you know, e even being an entrepreneur, if you ask me, you know, 15 years ago, 10 years ago, I would have said, there's no chance. I'm just not that kind of person. I'm not that kind of risk taker. Uh, I'm, I'm risk averse. I'm an introvert. I'm, I'm all the things. Um, but then I started interacting with people who, who were running their own practices. And I was like, wow, if these guys can do it, I can surely do it. So if I didn't, if I didn't put myself in those, in fact, they're the ones who should have imposters. <laughs> Um, so, uh, so I think, um, you know, just the more conversations I've had, the more, the more, uh, interactions I've had with folks in positions of, of power, positions of places that I'd like to be, um, I realized that, you know, the bar is not as high as I thought. We talked about imposter syndrome, but imposter syndrome's, um, fraternal twin is worthiness. Hmm. Can you talk to me a little bit about, you know, we're dealing with imposter syndrome, right? And, and, and all of the, the goodness that that brings, and I'm being facetious here, mm -hmm. but worthiness, worthiness to be in that room, yeah. you know, we can deal with our imposter syndrome, right? Uh, from a symptomatic point of view, but yeah. worthiness is also underneath all of that. How do you couch yourself in your worthiness? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's a great question. Um, it is, uh, it's not something that can be done in, in a professional setting. <laughs> it, it has to come from somewhere else. Um, and, and for me, uh, that, that worthiness and finding out my self-worth and, you know, do I belong in certain spaces, um, means that I, I have to ground myself and center myself on something else. Uh, um, it, I, the, 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 the work environment is not going to validate me. There's nothing about that, 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 that world that is going to, um, give me that sense of worth. So everybody has their own thing. <laughs> I'd love to hear what's yours, uh, JDP for me. Okay. It's, it's, it's been my faith. Um, you know, it's, it's been centering myself on, 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 on Sikh faith traditions, which is deeply involved in, um, service, which is deeply involved in, um, seeking justice for those who are, uh, uh, uh underestimated and, 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 and such. And so I think, uh, you know, grounding myself in that work, um, uh, gives me a sense of belonging and worthiness, which makes it then much easier, easier to, bring to bring to my work, workplace. 
Yeah, I mean, work work for me in certain instances brings validation. Yeah. Right. I have worked really hard to get here where I am today mm -hmm. to be able to sit down and have a conversation with someone like yourself. You know what? All of the decisions and trials and tribulations and challenges and successes have all led to this very moment. And yeah. for me, I have to look back and see what is it that work, the work itself is giving me, right? In terms of satisfaction, in terms of reward, in terms of validation, but also there, I balance that with what I have going on in my life, yeah. right? my family, my girls and, and seeing them be successful. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's that whole thing like, you know, the, the, American, I, the American dream is for you to have success and then for your kids, kids to be more successful than you. 100%. Right. And, and so when I see how that and the good job that I did there, that helps me center and recognize my worth. So that I walk into a room, I'm not worried about whether I'm, you know, you think I'm worthy to be in this room. I, I'm here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <That's> well, <it. laughs> Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. And, and um, you know, I, I definitely, you know, we, we share that in common with, with uh, fatherhood and being being girl dads. Uh, so uh, girl dads. I think, girl dads. You, know, it, you know, when um, when you when you get that positive affirmation and uh, there are like very little other, uh, you know, uh, very little else matters. <laughs> so very little else matters. You're absolutely right. Um, that, that that's that's definitely a centering force for sure. We done a lot of talking and you hit on. Uh, something that is really important is our values. And you said that the Sikh religion brings, helps you center in your values and your morals. And then you, you express the values of family and work. And so how important are values for individuals and understanding? Yeah, it's, it's everything to me. Um, and it's, you know, I, even though I've worked in the, the nonprofit space uh, for many, many years, um, I, I didn't always feel like I was doing the right thing. And I didn't always feel like I was doing things that were aligned with my values. I was, um, you know, there's lots of organizations that are nonprofits. Not all of them are doing great things. I, mm. I'm just going to say it. Um, you know, and, and they sh a lot of them surely don't uh, align with uh, my, my values and such. Um, and, and so I did feel some of that internal conflict there. Um, also in the way that we do things. Um, you know, and, you know, I, I recognize that, you know, although I, you know, want to run a business and, and be able to provide for my family and, and for my, my employees to do the same, um, I don't think that has to come at a cost of taking advantage of the, of the nonprofits that are out there. They are also doing important things. They're also so, so I, I sometimes felt there was an imbalance there that, you know, sure, uh, we want to run a business, but uh some of the things that we're asking for are just over, uh, they're, they're too far reaching. Um, they're not yeah. necessary or, you know, we're, we're forcing, you know, this nonprofit down a path that they probably don't need to go down. This may not be the right fit for them. Um, and, and those often went to deaf ears because I, I was not really in any position of power. This is just me, you know, you know, building relationships with my clients. Um, and so, uh, starting my own practice has really given me the ability to do things the way I think is right. Uh, that is right for nonprofit. So, you know, I don't believe that you, uh, you you just take a consulting model that worked for Deloitte or, you know, Accenture and then just shove it into a nonprofit and assume, assume it's going to work. Nonprofits are, are complex. They are they they are dealing with a lot of circumstances that a lot of for profit companies are not. Um, so as a consultant, I need to understand that I need to be flexible. I need to be, uh, adaptable and I need to build my business in a way that allows for that to happen. Otherwise I don't belong in this space. Um, and, uh, and by doing that, um, I, I feel it, it has, uh, allowed me to sleep at night <laughs> knowing we're doing the right things by, by a client. So for example, if crisis arises and they have a, a humanity crisis that they have to deal with and they say, we have to pause this project for three weeks. I don't throw up my hands in the air and say, oh, well, that means you're going to lose your resources and we're going to still have to build my team and I have nowhere else to put my resources. So we're going to bill you for it. But no, no, no. 
you're a nonprofit. That's what you're supposed to do. So we're going to figure it out. We're going to find a way to, to pause this project and to pick up you know, where we left off when you're ready. Um, and that's my job to figure that out because I do work, because I, I work exclusively with nonprofits. So that's my, my problem. Um, um, you need to do your thing. So um, we've, we've built one tenth and we've modeled things in such a way through some trial and error. We were really figuring it out and, and, and have put a model together that, that is uh, very flexible for nonprofits and allows me to do things with my values in mind. Yeah. Um, it also allows me to uh, work with organizations uh, that that are uh, that I feel are doing good things, and, and say no to those that are that are not that are you know have some you know, whether it's racist ideals or uh, you know. Uh, uh, it, not recognize the inclusive inclusivity and diversity of folks. I don't want to work with those organizations. Uh, um, so, so it, uh, it's been very refreshing and very rewarding to be able to, um, call some of those shots. <laughs> and, you know, when we do hire people, we tell them the same, you know, Hey, this is, we're not going to work with organizations that promote hatred in any way or promote discrimination in any way. Um, you know, and, and so like, if this is not what you're cool with, then this might not be the right place to work for you. But, um, but if you are, then, then we're going to really do some great stuff together. Values twin sister is goal setting. Yeah. You can have values all day long, but if you don't have a goal, what are you going to do? So right. how important would you say is goal setting? I'd say it's very important. Um, of course. Um, but I, and, and it's something I've, I've been challenged with because, uh, I have set a lot of goals, <laughs> um, but uh, I often feel like the, the the ship is moving sometimes, and and so and and it, it's it's moving, it's going different directions, and I've I've been doing a lot of pivots, and maybe that's not something I'll do once we our our organization grows a lot further, um, but uh, uh, you know so so I've not been like the best with like sticking to the goal and like that is the end all be all. You know, I'll give you an example where you know. We, we, you mentioned it in my intro, we focus on implementations, on managed services, we focus on strategy. Um, but, you know, someone came and heard one of my talks and said, um, wow, you, you really have a passion for this DEI work. Would you be willing to do a, uh, a DEI audit for our company? And it's nowhere on our website. It's not listed as our services. It is, it is, um, but, you know, my goodness, like, I, I felt like it was such a genuine ask. Mm -hmm. and I, not it isn't always the case but but in this case it was and um you know we have the expertise we, we've done the research why not do it so so we have gone for opportunities that you know i've had clients reach out to us and say okay i know you're a technology company but you know you've spent so much time learning about us we're rebranding one of our nonprofit programs can you help us rebrand <laughs> can you help wow. us with our so i i should probably jdp say no to all these things because they don't really align with any of our goals that we set out at the beginning of the year um, but, you know, I also feel like our clients look at us as trusted partners mm. and this is we're unique to the nonprofit space. Uh, you know, we are their trusted partners. Uh, they trust us with everything to the point where, you know, we don't even advertise anymore because it's, it's all word of mouth. It's all trust-based relationships. Um, so we have deviated from our goals at times and I, I don't regret it. Um, now maybe there will be some times where <laughs> there, there will come a time where I'm going to have to be more goal centered and, and really focus on that. Um, but you know, in this space of being a trusted partner for nonprofits, sometimes the goals move around a little bit. And that's where values come in, right? 100%. Because values help you, they're your North Star, and they help you better define uh, the decisions that you're making, right? Because maybe we didn't set out to do this, yeah. but the relationships that we've established and the trust that we've established with our yeah. customers is basically surfacing something we didn't even know was going to pop up. Yeah. And so from a values perspective, you're like, okay, do we do this? Yeah. And, and, and what you said earlier, just to paraphrase is yeah, because it seemed the right thing to do because it aligned totally with our mission and our values. Exactly. So, so it, to, to, to that point, uh, you know, our, our goals may change, but our values don't, you know, that like mm. that, that is to your point to the, the I like the word you use the North star. Uh, and so that's, what's driving us. And, and again, you know, as we grow and evolve, we, we might have to be a little bit more, we might have to do more regular goal and value alignment, but, but right now we're, we're letting our values uh, lead us and, and it's worked out. Okay. So far. <laughs> well, well, uh, I wish you all the success in the world and I'm going to pause the, we're still taping. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm an old TV guy. Tape, okay. <laughs> hey, uh, well, Ruben, we appreciate your voice adding to the to you are excellence um, profiles of coaches and mentors and exceptional people, of which I've 
I wouldn't be talking to you if I didn't think you were. So <laughs> thank you. Well, you know, I've asked you a series of questions, Ruben, yeah. and we got to know you. We got to know your business. We got to know a little bit about you. But I feel that there are a set of questions that we have formulated. Okay. We're really going to cut down deep into who Ruben is. And we call it the get to know a coach questionnaire Excellent. or mentor Excellent. or, you know, depending on what persona we want to stick with. Yeah, yeah. Ruben. Yes. Are you ready to take the get to know a mentor slash coach questionnaire? I'm ready. Very ready. All right. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Guys, it's time for get to know a mentor slash coach questionnaire. Ruben, first question. Yeah. Favorite sport? Um, that would have to be soccer. Uh, Ooh. girls are soccer players and um i was a soccer coach for a little while and i'll, I'll be specific we're big fans of of uh the, the women u.s women's national team as well as the the women's team here the washington spirit so uh so i, I would say that's that's where uh you know, i'm a biggest fan of that <laughs> you want a life-changing event take your daughters to a wnba game well, it will change their lives. I had a conversation about, uh, you know, we, we've seen some college games at my alma mater at, at UMBC, but we've yeah. not gone to a WNBA game. But Oh, man, it is a life changer. We used to bring our girls back in the day, because, again, I'm yeah. kind of a couple of exits down the highway from you. But anyway, yeah. when our daughters were small, and they still talk about going to those games. So, I'm, you know, you were the second person to tell me that this week, so I'm, I'm going to make sure that happens. <laughs> All right. So, so we got the Washington Mystics, so I'm going to check them out. Favorite sport? <laughs> Soccer. Okay. Yeah. Next question. And I've had to expand this one a little bit. So cats, dogs, or reptiles? Oh, gosh. Of the choices, I'm going to go with dogs. Dogs. Yeah. All right. Do you have a dog? I do not. I'm, I'm honestly, uh, this is, I'm not going to have a lot of, uh, I'm not going to up after this. I'm not really a pet person. I didn't grow up with a pet. Uh, <laughs> I did it, of the three choices. I, I, I the three choices, don't. it would be a dog. Okay. <laughs> respect. All right. <laughs> so the next question, mountains or ocean slash beach? Yeah. Ah, um, mountains. Um, I've probably spent more time in oceans and beaches, but... Uh, I think I appreciate the mountains more. I'm, I'm really, I enjoy hiking and, um, you know, being in those environments, um, a lot more. So I, I think I'd, I'd probably go with mountains. All right. So yeah. the next question has caused a lot of controversy, okay. a lot of angst to the, to the, to the guests. So right. buckle up. Here we go. Okay. Regardless of genre or medium, favorite artist. That's an easy one, JDP. I can't imagine that causing angst for anybody. Uh, for me, anybody who knows me well would, would answer this for me. Uh, that would be Prince. Yes. Uh, <laughs> uh, Any particular song or album? Oh, gosh. I mean, there's there's a lot. I would say if there was one that was most influential, it would probably be Sign of the Times. Mm. 1986, I believe that was. Yeah. Of course, there's Purple Rain. There's of course. Uh, there's so many, but I, I I would probably say those definitely the early earlier years. Yeah, uh, were, were my favorite. Besides the times was definitely most influential. Nice. Uh, also, first conference, uh, first concert I ever been to. Rip, yeah. Um, but yeah, in terms of you know musician, artist, poet, he was he was all the things. Um, he was he was, the, he was a triple threat. Yeah, and in my opinion, really influenced a lot of the music that a lot of the good music that we hear now. <laughs> so, all right all right props to that okay final question yeah and this is equally as controversial sometimes okay. sometimes hard for people yeah. yeah favorite food or cuisine i'd have to go with uh caribbean um Ooh. any particular country i uh no i i don't <laughs> I don't know, although the Caribbean places I go to, I've been meaning to ask if there's, uh, I, I, I don't know enough to know the differentiation of, of like which, which foods come from which country, but um, just like the spices, mm. are, like the combination of spices are, are like my kind of style, just um, um, it, it's, it's got a little bit of the South, South Asian, you know, flair that I grew up with, plus yeah. something special that I can't really describe. So yeah. 
Um, I shouldn't, I, yeah, I'll, I'll make a point to learn more about where, where the different foods I like come okay. from. Um, definitely the, the combination of spice and, and, and uh, is, is um, if, if I had a choice, like if I'm traveling or, or uh, you know, end up in a hotel for, for work, you know, that's usually the first place I try to find around me. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. Around me. Well, Ruben, thank <laughs> you so much for taking the questionnaire. We now know a little bit more about you. And uh, definitely appreciate you spending a little bit of time with us this afternoon. But before we go, do you have any parting words? I'll I'll share something I, I shared with my students on the last day of class that we had. Um, you know, the semester just ended recently, and you know, here I am in a room full of technologists, and, and particularly the class happens to be majority technologists of color. And um, you know, I tell them to be curious. Um, you know, we used to think. Uh, that you know, when we saw some of the caution around uh, AI or or some of the the bias and discrimination that can be wrapped up in you know language models and such, we thought that oh well you know if we have technologists of color that will solve the problem. If we have more programmers of color, that should solve everything. And I'm starting to realize that's not the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what we need is uh, a curiosity. Um, that uh, you know when we're asked to do something by you know the powers that be. Now we not just do it. We we ask some questions. You know, well, hmm. well, if if I did do this, don't you think that this, you know, what what is the purpose of capturing this particular data? You know, uh, you know, for this particular need, or um, well, if I built this algorithm, is it possible that this might discriminate certain you know segments of the population? Um, if I did take this data, is it possible that you know it's not secure enough and it might get into the hands of the wrong people? Um, so it's it's that. So I think just having technologists of color doesn't solve everything. Um, what we need is is folks to um, be curious, and, and that doesn't necessarily have to be just people of color. In fact, it really needs to be everyone. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as we kind of you know enter into this new era of technology, of of working, uh, of of data management, um, that we're very curious. Um, if we intend to do things in an ethical way, we tend to do things in in um, uh, in a way that that benefits society. Uh, as technologists, we can't be just the one that take instructions. We have to be asking questions and making sure we're doing things in a way that's aligned with some some shared values. Wow. And curiosity. Absolutely. Yeah. Ruben, yeah. thank you so much for your time and being with us today. Guys, we've been talking to Ruben Singh, uh, the CEO of One Tenth Consulting. Uh, you can find his information and socials down in the description. And while you're there, leave a comment. Let us know how we did and what content you would like us to bring or any particular uh, folks you think might be a great interview for the channel. But until then, this is your coach JDP reminding you that you are excellent. Take care. We'll see you next time.